Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started. I see some people signed in. So let's, uh, let's get going. Welcome to today's webinar on cold chain equipment management. This is Greg Roche, and I'm here again with my colleague, Barbara Lamphere. We're both very happy to be with you today to present the topic. As with our other webinars, we will try to leave time for some questions at the end of the presentation. As an ongoing reminder, please use the question answer function by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, rather than sending questions using the chat function. Now let's get to today's topic. This is our sixth and final webinar in the Immunization Supply Chain Leadership Webinar Series. We want to welcome anyone who is joining us for the first time and thank everyone for investing your time to learn more about supply chain leadership. I'm Barbara Lamphere. I'm a senior technical advisor with JSI, and I've been working in the area of supply chain and capacity building for more than 30 years, covering a variety of health programs, including immunization, across a number of geographies. And I'm Greg Roche. I'm also a senior technical advisor at JSI, only working for about the last 20 years in supply chain, but longer than that in the general areas of capacity development, organizational development, performance improvement, and so forth. We're also very pleased to have a special guest, Sheikh Koulibaly, Immunization and Logistics Advisor at JSI. He's based in Niamey, Niger. Koulibaly, can you please introduce yourself to our audience? Hi, Greg. Hi, Barbara. And hi, everybody. I'm Sheikh Koulibaly immunization and logistic advisor at GSI. I've been working for GSI for more than five years in the area of immunization. I have supported many countries in cold chain rapid assessment, cold room temperature mapping, vaccine supply chain optimization, and vaccine management in general. Great, you're very welcome. Let's look at the objectives for this webinar on cold chain equipment management. We'll start by identifying key cold chain equipment that is required for, immun for an immunization program. We will look at some of the benefits and components of an effective cold chain equipment repair and maintenance system. And finally, we will be thinking again about indicators, data, and data sources, but this time specifically related to measuring the performance of our cold chain equipment repair and maintenance system. I do want to make a couple of special comments. There's a lot of information available when we're thinking about and discussing cold chain and our time as always is limited. We had wanted to include a discussion of how to plan for and manage the inventory of cold chain equipment, but with the amount of information we would need to cover that and to cover our three objectives, and the amount of time that we have, we have decided to split that discussion into a future webinar on its own. We'll give you more information about that as it is available. As another note, we will be showing drawings and pictures of different cold chain equipment. These are chosen as representative examples and are not an endorsement of any particular brand or product. I'm sure everyone is eager to get started, so let's do. Let's tackle our first objective by looking at the various types of cold chain equipment that will be needed to properly handle the cold chain products for our immunization program. So Kulaban Bali, first we will start with the central level and perhaps in regions or other larger subcentral facilities where we have cold rooms or freezer rooms. Yes, Barbara. Here we see a cold room storage in Niger. This room, as typical cold and freezer room, have temperature range from plus two degrees to eight degrees Celsius. 
for products that require cold storage, such as pentavalent vaccine, water. And from minus 15 to minus 25 degrees Celsius for frozen vaccine products, such as OPV, measles. Okay. Next, we have refrigerators and freezers. And here we have an example of a top opening and a front opening refrigerator. There are many different types of refrigerator and freezer, including those that are powered by electricity, solar energy, gas, or kerosene. And they cover the same temperature range as the cold room and freezer room, but for smaller quantities. A health facility refrigerator should be chosen based on the most reliable power sources available and combined capacity needed for vaccine and water pack storage. A lot of countries are moving to install of solar refrigerators, while they are more expensive to buy and install than electric refrigerators. They have no running costs apart from cleaning, preventing maintenance. The two taps are solar battery unit connected to a battery bank, which is charged by solar panel, and B, solar direct drive units that are powered directly by solar panel. We do also want to emphasize that typical domestic refrigerator, the kind you will be used at home in your kitchen to store food, do not have good temperature control and cannot keep vaccine cool during electricity cut for more than two or three hours. These units are not specifically built to design to store vaccine. For this reason, domestic refrigerators are now recommended by WHO for vaccine storage. Next down the chain, we have cold boxes. Can you explain a little bit about cold boxes? So, a cold box is an installed container that can be lined with water pack to keep vaccine and dillion in the requirement temperature range during transport or short-term storage. Depending on the model, coal boxes can be used to store vaccine for a period up to two days or more when there is no electricity available. Coal boxes are typically used to carry monthly vaccine supply from district store to health facility and also from health facility to heart recession if vaccine carrier is too small. And when we talk about cold boxes, we should think about something called cold life and cool life. That is correct, Barbara. Cold life of a cold box takes the maximum length of time that a closed cold box can maintain temperature below plus 10 degrees Celsius when it's lined with frozen ice pipe. Current pre-qualified cold box models have maximum cool life of two to seven days when tested at a constant temperature of plus 43 degrees Celsius. The cool life of coal box is the maximum length of time the closed coal box can maintain temperature below plus 20 degrees Celsius if lined with cold water pipe that have been stored in a refrigerator. Current pre-qualified coal box models have a maximum cool life of 12 to two days when tested at the constant temperature of 43 degrees Celsius. And next we have vaccine carriers. A vaccine carrier looks like a small cold box. Well, yes, you're right. They look familiar. However, they are a little bit different. As noticed, vaccine carriers are smaller than cold boxes. So they are easy to carry they are generally used to transfer vaccine and durian to outreach site also. As cold boxes, a vaccine carrier can also be used for very short term storage if needed. Current pre-qualified vaccine carrier as cold life with frozen ice pipe of between 
12 and 15 hours at 43 degrees Celsius and cool life with cold water pipe of between three to 18 hours. Another important part, I think, is the water packs, which you already mentioned as being associated with cold box and boxes and with vaccine carriers. Then we can also think of ice packs or gel packs. Yes, Barbara. Water packs are used to line inside of cold box or vaccine carrier. Water packs are used to keep vaccine at the requirement temperature range inside cold boxes and vaccine carriers. In order to protect your vaccine, it is important to use the correct number and size of water pipe to follow the instruction printed inside the lid of the container. To ensure optimal performance, WHO recommends the use of pre-qualified water pipes. The appropriate temperature of water pipe will depend on the type of vaccine being transported and we've seen some temperature related information here. The next cold chain item that we will talk about for storage is the foam pad. Yes, a foam pad is a simple piece of soft sponges like material that fits precisely on the top of water pipe. Inside a vaccine carrier, while still permitting the lid of the vaccine carrier to fully close, the foam pad is provided by the manufacturer of the vaccine carrier. The foam pad usually has slides in which vaccine vial can be inserted snugly and protected. And it is important to keep the hard vaccine carrier lid close whenever possible to conserve the inner temperature. We should emphasize that WHO does not recommend the use of homemade foam pads. Health workers should use the pad supply with the carrier and try to keep it clean and free from dust and dirt. Well, we've been talking about equipment and we've seen the examples of cold rooms, freezer rooms, and refrigerators and freezers that can store larger quantities of vaccines. And then cold boxes and vaccine carriers used together with water packs and foam inserts that can store and transport smaller quantities of vaccines. That's great. And I think we also need to think about refrigerated trucks which will be used to transfer larger quantities of vaccine and related cold chain products, such as from the central store to the region, and then perhaps down to the district. A refrigerated truck is almost like a moving cold room or moving freezer room. And then aside from the examples that we've just seen for storing and transporting vaccines, we can also think about things that we have to consider as smaller types of equipment. Yes. We can also think of things like vaccine vial monitor and temperature monitoring device. Okay, well, unfortunately, we don't have time to go into great detail about each of these, but let's quickly do so, show some examples. The webinar participants can consult the reference documents they will receive after the webinar for more detailed information. Sure, great. That's a good idea. What can you tell us quickly about vaccine vial monitors? Very quickly, vaccine vial monitor DVMs are the only temperature monitor device that routinely accompany vaccine throughout the entire supply chain. A VVM is a chemical indicator label attached to the vaccine container, either on the vial, samples, or dropper by the vaccine manufacturer. As the container moves throughout the supply chain, the vaccine monitor device records its cumulative heat exposure through a gradual change in color. 
if the color of the inner square is the same color or darker than the outer circle, the vaccine has been exposed to too much heat and should be disregarded. And what do we see here? This diagram shows the typical placement of vaccine vial monitor on different types of vaccine packaging. Okay, great. Let's quickly look at some different temperature monitoring devices. Yes, the purpose of all of this is the same, to track the temperature of vaccine storage that we know if recommended storage temperature are not being respected, either too warm or too cold. Here are some electronic phrase indicators. These are small digital devices that are placed with freeze sensitive vaccine during transport or storage. The device has a visual indicator that show whenever the vaccine has been exposed to freezing temperature. Here is an example of an integrated digital thermometer. Current pre-qualified vaccine refrigerators and freezer are equipped with device like this. An internal temperature sensor monitor the storage compartment and real-time temperature reading is, is displayed on the unit's control panel. Here is a steam thermometer and accompanying paper record to record the temperature reading. These devices only provide an instantaneous temperature reading. For this reason, WHO no longer recommends them as the main monitoring device in vaccine refrigerators. However, they remain an essential backup device because they do not require a battery or other power sources. Because the steam thermometer only provides a discrete one-time reading, you will probably need to associate the thermometer with a paper base or a record to manually record the temperature readings. Here is a dial thermometer, and WHO no longer recommends this for monitoring vaccine temperature. Uh, here we have something that's called a remote temperature monitoring device. What's that? Newer electronic temperature monitoring devices can also include a remote aspect so that you can monitor the temperature from the device using your smartphone. You can also get SMS alerts from some devices as soon as the temperature anormally is experienced. However, as with any technology, remote technology allow, alone is not enough to ensure optimal outcome in maintaining ideal temperature range. For example, a study in Laos found that although remote reporting of temperature data was successful, additional training was required to enable data manager to effectively use the data and translate it into effective decision making highlighting the importance of addressing health worker behavior in addition of technical solutions. And here are a few recommendations by WHO in terms of type and use of different cold chain equipment, focusing on the health facility level. To summarize the cold chain equipment section of the webinar, let's keep in mind that different levels in the system will require different types of equipment. Depending on the types of vaccine they use and store, the quantities they are using and storing and transporting, and other considerations. Here are a few other resources that we will share with you after the webinar, 
And I also want to mention that we have used the same materials in the preparation of this webinar. Let's now try to identify a few of the benefits of having an effective cold chain equipment repair and maintenance system and some ideas on cold chain equipment maintenance. That's a great idea. We'll start by just showing this list of likely benefits to having an effective cold chain equipment repair and maintenance system. Generally, we can observe that if we can keep a maintenance schedule, we will have less need for repairs or equipment replacement, both of which can be more expensive and more time consuming. I think there are some basic procedures for maintaining and monitoring the functional status that staff can be trained to implement. That is great. That is correct. There are procedures for maintaining each type of cold chain equipment. And here is a list to remind us of the types of cold chain equipment we have just been talking about. Now, unfortunately, we don't have time to go into all the details on maintenance for all of these cold chain equipment items, but let's just look at two examples, refrigerators and solar systems. And don't forget, we will share some resources at the end of the webinar that go into a lot of detail on this topic. So let's start with, um, with ref the refrigerators. What can we say about defrosting vaccine refrigerators? The refrigerators only work well if it's properly installed and is then clean and defrost regularly. Thick ice in the freezer compartment and on the evaporator plate does not keep a refrigerator cool. Instead, they make the refrigerator work harder and use more electricity, gas, kerosene, or solar panel. Refrigerators should be defrosted regularly or when ice is more than 0.5 centimeter thick, whichever comes first. We should also note that if the refrigerators need to be defrosted more than once a month, check for this common problem. Perhaps the staff are opening the door too often, more than three times daily. Perhaps the door is not closed properly. Perhaps the door still needs to be replaced. And what about maintaining solar power systems? Solar panel system needs to be cleaned and checked and the battery of solar battery to refrigerators must be inspected and maintained. Our participants can see here some of the different tasks that need to be done daily, periodically, and annually. Okay, what about maintaining gas refrigerators? As with solar equipment, these are tasks that you can do daily, weekly, and annually. They are listed here. You can read them here and just want to point out, always change the bar of gas before it's completely empty and always keep a spare bottle of gas. And what about for maintaining kerosene refrigerators? Again, they are daily, weekly, and periodic maintenance stats show here for reference. And finally, we have maintaining cold boxes and vaccine carriers. Yes, they are relatively easy to maintain, but still must be maintained. Vaccine carrier and cold boxes must be dry well after use with their lids pop open. If they are left wet with the lid closed, they will become moldy, mold and dump can affect the sale of the cold box and vaccine carrier and may contaminate the vaccine. If possible, 
stall co-batting and vaccine career with the leads open. So Koulibaly, let's hope that our regular maintenance program will help to reduce cold chain equipment malfunctions or breakdowns. But if we do have something go wrong with our refrigerator, for example, what should we do? Well, great. If something does go wrong, first we must protect the vaccine and then take the cause of the problem. Move the vaccine to another cold chain equipment until the refrigerator is repaired. For a problem that can be solved quickly, a cold vaccine or vaccine carrier lined with condition ice pack can be used for temporary storage. For a problem that might take longer to solve, another refrigerator is needed. Always keep a freezer indicator with freeze sensitive vaccine. You can then restore the refrigerators to working order. And of course, you should record the breakdown on the daily temperature monitor chart. Do you have any other comments or hints about cold chain equipment maintenance to share with our viewers? Well, a couple of things to come to mind. One is that we can outsource maintenance, hire a company to do your maintenance for you. You can also include a service agreement as part of the procurement of the device. Then you can also procure replacement part at the same time as procuring the equipment to be sure you will have them if needed. Finally, don't forget for all facility staff must be trained in how to recognize cold chain problem so that inspection can be taken place as soon as possible and then repair as soon as possible. Okay, let's now talk a little bit about cold chain equipment indicators and related information. Here are the disk indicators that we saw in a previous webinar, indicators that we can use to monitor the performance of our immunization supply chain. And we observed that a few of those indicators, the ones that are highlighted here, are directly related to today's topic, cold chain equipment. Let's look at these two in more detail. Okay, first we're gonna talk about the functional status of cold chain equipment. And we saw, as we saw in an earlier webinar, this indicator tells us the proportion or percent of our cold chain equipment that is functional. And we see the definition here as a reminder. Based on the type of cold chain equipment, we just review. I think we also want to add refrigerator trucks and even the temperature monitor devices themselves to our list of coaching equipment for which we want to monitor operational status. Yeah, I think it's important that we that we monitor the status of all of our cold chain equipment, no matter if it's a sophisticated truck or a, or a simple temperature monitoring device. You're right, Kulabali. Um, let's look here. In the performance monitoring webinar, we saw the data needed to calculate this indicator. And, and here's a reminder of how you calculate this indicator. You get the percent of cold chain equipment functioning by dividing the total number of functioning cold chain equipment devices by the total number of cold chain equipment designated for use and then multiplying it by 100. So this indicator can be aggregated for all cold chain equipment or disaggregated by type. So for example, you might look at the percentage of cold rooms that are functioning or solar fridges or gas fridges that are functioning by using this same formula of number of functioning over the number of devices that, that are designated for use in this reporting. And this was an example that we used in, in a, the previous webinar, again, as a reminder. Um, so for the, in this case, for the aggregated indicator, if we have a total of 124 
pieces of cold chain equipment. Um, and we have 110 that are functioning, then our indicator would be 88.7% of cold chain equipment functioning. Very simple mathematical formula. And another reminder of the sources of data for this indicator, but noting that functional status has to be obtained from each facility that has cold chain equipment. So depending on what what the indicator is trying to measure, you're trying to measure the whole system, or you're trying to measure a certain part, you need to have the data from each of the places where the cold chain equipment is, is used and held. Either this can be, this data can be obtained either by a report or by in-person inspection, but you can see there are some uh, examples of the type of data sources you might use to gather this information. Now let's look at the other cold chain equipment indicator from the list of risk indicators. We'll cover this new one in more detail. We're looking at temperature alarm rates, and this is used as a proxy for measuring vaccine potency and safety. Exposure to temperatures outside this range indicates a risk of heat or freeze damage to sensitive vaccines. The following questions can be answered by monitoring this indicator. Is cold chain equipment functioning properly? Is there a risk of heat exposure to vaccines? Is there a risk of freeze damage to vaccines? Which cold chain equipment devices are in need of repair or replacement? This information also comes from the disk indicator reference sheets that were shared earlier and that we will share again after this webinar. In terms of the data needed, we will want to track the number of excursions or alarms outside the designated temperature ranges. Alarm thresholds are set by WHO. An excursion, as you probably all know, is defined as any event during which the temperature inside the cold chain equipment goes below two degrees Celsius or above eight degrees. A high temperature alarm is defined as any event during which the temperature goes above eight degrees for 10 continuous hours. A low temperature alarm is defined as any event during which the temperature goes below minus 0 0.5 degrees for one hour. For the indicator, the temperature alarm is simply the recorded number of high and low temperature alarms per reporting period. So this indicator can be calculated using the number of cold chain equipment devices with more than a set threshold of temperature alarms in, the, in any given period. So if it can be further broken down by reasons for the alarms, if known, and into resolved and unresolved alarms. So for example here, a facility has one ice-lined refrigerator with a 30-day temperature logger. During a supervisory visit, the temperature data is downloaded and the following temperature alarms are noted. This facility had an alarm rate of two alarms during the month of April, as an example. Or the heat and cold alarms can be reported separately. And say, for example, in this in this case, with an alarm rate of one alarm per month for each. If the cause of the alarm is known, this indicator can be further disaggregated. For example, one heat alarm, say, for due to power outage, along with the one cold alarm. Here's another example, this time in a district comprising 40 health facilities. So we're, we're looking at a more aggregated situation, each of which is using a 30-day temperature recorder. There were a total of 16 alarms during the past month, the four high temperature alarms and 12 low temperature alarms. The rate is reported as four high temperature alarms per month and 12 low temperature alarms per month or 16 temperature alarms per month for these 40 facilities. And again, we want to look at the data sources. 
Um, the data can come from any of these sources, whether we have manual records and reports, our paper-based data collection systems from the different um, temperature monitoring devices, or if we're re using remote monitoring devices. Here are some additional indicators that we can track related to our cold chain equipment. Some are related to the, the use of your cold chain capacity, some relate to maintenance and repair, and others in data so, uh, energy sources and so forth. So take a moment to, to look through these lists of other cold chain equipment related indicators. And as we've been saying each time we talk about indicators, we also need to think about the data system, the LMIS, the Logistics Management Information System that we're using to collect the data. So for cold chain equipment, we need to be sure that our information system is collecting the data needed in order to assess whether the cold chain equipment is functioning indicators whether we have that data in order to assess those cold chain equipment indicators. And if we don't have a way of collecting that data, we need to revise our LMIS, our system to collect that data. Also, as we said earlier in the webinar on performance and performance monitoring, we still need to be aware of the number of indicators that we are trying to track and ensure that we are not trying to track every indicator. Also, that we have the data needed, as Barbara just said, to track the indicators, and that the data collection and reporting system is not too burdensome on facility staff. Certainly, remote temperature monitoring devices with SMS alarms could enable us to collect data on more indicators without burdening staff. But then we also need the technology and people trained to correctly use and maintain that technology and manage the additional data. We don't want to collect a lot of data of poor quality, nor do we want to collect data that will not be used for decision making. We are just finishing our discussion of indicators and system performance for cold chain. And earlier in the webinar, we were talking about cold chain equipment and remote temperature monitoring. In one of the previous webinars, we were talking about data review teams. Here is an interesting article that we found that reviews a Kenya experience and demonstrates the positive impacts that monitoring combined with data review teams can have on our cold chain equipment system. We will share the link to the article with you after the webinar but to highlight some of the results that the study found, they found improvements in at least two of their indicators. Total time spent in the correct range increased from 83.9% to 90.9%, and time spent in the too cold range decreased from 6.5% to 1.5%. The conclusion notes that using remote temperature monitoring and a structured approach such as data review teams can have a very positive impact on cold chain. We will provide the full article as one of the resources in the follow-up email to this webinar. This is the end of this webinar. Today, we have identified key cold chain equipment required for an immunization program, explained the benefits and components of an effective cold chain equipment repair and maintenance system, and identified indicators, data, and sources of data to measure the performance of the cold chain equipment and maintenance system. We have time to address a few of the questions that have come in. So let me look at these questions. Um, the first question says, hello, thank you for the excellent material. I think WHO does not recommend the use of gel ice packs as they um, bring temperature too low, not sure. Um, Gulabali, do you have any comments on the use of gel ice packs and what, um, 
Yes, gel eye spike actually are not recommended anymore for free sensitive vaccine. But for euphalized vaccine and vaccine that can be stored at negative temperature, some manufacturers still use this type of uh, uh, the these types of stuff to ship vaccine. Even in Yame, we do have still ice gel uh, ice pack here. So, but it's for free sensitive vaccine, it's not recommended anymore. So, okay. probably in the future, we will see that. Uh, manufacturer will stop using them, definitely. All right, that's that's good to know, know that there are some changes there. Okay, um, uh, these are all, all these questions are from the from our same participant. Thank you, Valerie. Um, and she's suggesting that that maintenance should be divided into two phases: preventive and corrective maintenance. Um, and maybe we would also say corrective maintenance. I'm not sure if, if corrective maintenance, if you're thinking of corrective maintenance as repair, but um, that there's these two phases and that preventive can be handled by the user and while the corrective maintenance might be handled by a technician. So. Yes, I think she, she is right. Uh, preventing maintenance is daily or weekly uh, maintenance tasks like cleaning the uh, the refrigerators make sure the door still is correctly and just if you're using solar refrigerators to make sure that the solar panel is clean that has preventive maintenance that can be done by uh, the health worker corrective maintenance is big repair when you have to replace condenser or fan that need technician uh, that should be done by uh, either outsource or if you have technician in the site that can do those kind of things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and Valerie's also offered that there's also one indicator that can be used is also the uh, freezing test. So the, I guess, um, do you have experience with that Kulibali using freezing as an indicator? It says one uh, the, 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 the The freezing test actually that's what we call a, a shaking test too, just to make sure that if you want to make sure that the vaccine is not uh, for sensitive, free sensitive vaccine, just if you are suspecting them mm -hmm. to be frozen, you can do the shaking test. That's how we call okay. it shaking test. So you can put okay. it as an indicator too. Okay, great, great. Um, Ibrahim has asked a question about can domestic freezers be using used for freezing of ice packs, not the vaccine, not maintaining vaccine, but for freezing of ice packs. I've seen it in some regions, but actually it's not recommended. WHO always recommended uh, refrigerators and freezer that's been pre-qualified, PQS. That's for vaccine, whatever is vaccine concern is always preferable to use pre-qualified PQS refrigerators and freezer. Okay, All right. So don't use your domestic freezers. Those are not, not recommended, everyone. Okay, great. Um, one more input from Valerie. Um, any material to strengthen preventive maintenance? And we think we're going to be sending some additional materials on preventive maintenance and uh, maintenance, but um, did Greg or, or um, Fulabali, anything else to add about what we should be doing for preventive maintenance? Uh, I'll let Koulibaly address if he has any other suggestions for preventive maintenance, but I do want to just reinforce, um, I'm sure that the materials that we'll be sending out have chapters uh, on uh, at least one of the documents that I'm thinking of has at least a chapter on uh, preventive maintenance. Yes, great. You like you say the material that will be sent has chapters on preventing maintenance. Also, I want to add, uh, manufacturer should come and train health worker on preventing maintenance and leave material in the country because each country use different type of refrigerator, different type of coach and equipment. So in each country is a little bit different. The manufacturer should leave. UNICEF should help uh, its country to provide them with 
those kind of material for specific coding and equipment. Uh, another question has come in from Carla, and this question is, is conditioning of ice packs still practice? I thought it might not be recommended by WHO. And so this is about the, the conditioning of the ice packs. Um. Yes, conditioning of ice pack is still recommended by WHO. It's something you need to recondition the ice pack before you put them in the vaccine carrier because in the, at the health facilities, all the vaccine should be at the temperature of plus, plus eight, uh, plus two to plus eight. So you need to recondition the ice pack just to make sure you hear some water sound and ice right. sound in the ice pack mm -hmm. before uh, you use. It's not recommended to put directly ice pack hard into the vaccine carrier. Okay. Um, and I think that's the, that was the last question from our audience. Um, um, in which case I will move on um, and say that we would like to remind you that um, after the webinar, you will be receiving a follow-up email and to which we will have all uh, resources that we used for the creation of this webinar uh, in that email so that you have the links to those resources we will also be sending you the link to the gaming app, reminding you that we are still continuing the game for this um, webinar series. And just to let you know, and I will send you in a follow-up email that uh, those of you who have participated in five out of six of the webinars will receive a certificate. You have until April 1st uh, to actually have reviewed to seen or reviewed you can you can look at past webinars on demand i will also include those links i've sent them out to most everybody already before but i'll include the links to all the previous webinars so you can earn your certificate and also we'll be playing continuing to play the the um, review game online that um, covers the content of this webinar and the previous webinars and uh, through April 1st and after that time, we will be um, awarding prizes to those who have the highest scores on the game. So um, we look forward to uh, some continued interaction at least through April 1st on, on these two areas and the viewing of the on-demand webinars and the playing of the game to review your knowledge of the content that we've gone over. Um, I just want to take a few moments, uh, Greg, we've advanced to the Boost slides to remind you that if you have not already joined the Boost community, um, which is a global community of immunization professionals that has recently been launched, they have a platform online and it's a great place to connect with other immunization professionals, to join in, in discussions and continue your learning. Um, I also want to... Um, we, Go to the next slide, please, Greg. The, um, one of the learning groups that is inside this Boost community that you can join is on immunization supply chain, and we will be having some di virtual discussions and probably some um, panel-led dis discussions on different supply chain topics using the Boost platform for, um, for that. So I hope that you will um, We'll join the Boost community. Um, the previous slide had the, um, the website. I will also send that in the follow-up email so that you and encourage you to join the Boost community. Uh, this is our final webinar in this series. We hope to have other webinar series in the future, but for this series, this is the final one. We want to thank Gavi for the funding of this webinar series. And we want to thank our various guest speakers over the last several months. Uh, we had Dominique Zwinkles from People That Deliver that came for our um, webinar on, um, on teams, um, your supply chain team. Amos Chwaya from JSI in Kenya, who joined us for the coverage webinar on linking coverage and to supply, chain, and supply chain management, Hanuk. Uh, Halamarian, who joined us for the, um, from Ethiopia for managing vaccines with other health commodities. And thank you, Kulabani, for joining us today. Thank you so much. Um, thank you. And I'd like for to thank you me. as well. <laughs> and 
Many thanks again to all of you for joining us, including those who weren't with us today, but who have participated in one or more of the previous webinars. We hope to meet you again in any future webinar series. We wish you continued success, and we want to remind everyone to continue to participate in discussions on IPHL on the Boost site. They're there for you as ongoing resource and a forum to raise and discuss issues related to vaccine immunization supply chain management and other supply um, chain or logistics related issues. Take care and have a good rest of your day or evening. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye.